Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Jude Blanchett, and I'm the Freeman Chair in China Studies at CSIS. Uh, I'm really delighted to be co-hosting this morning's event with uh, Scott Kennedy, who is the trustee chair in Chinese Business and Economics. And we're here to discuss a really fantastic uh, new book, which, which goes on sale, I believe, June 10th, called China's Civilian Army, The Making of Wolf Warrior Diplomacy, um, by the uh, uh, excellent Peter Martin, who uh, currently is a defense policy and intelligence reporter at Bloomberg News, but as the, the book jacket acknowledges, previously was a, a political correspondent based in, based in Beijing. And as we were just saying before we went live, the timing of this book is absolutely fantastic, um, as if Peter had a hand in guiding the wolf warrior trajectory uh, of China's diplomats. But Pete saw years ago that um, we needed something to help us understand the incentive structure, the behavior, the trajectory, the origins of this global diplomatic powerhouse that was the PRC. And so he has spent years trawling through diplomatic memoirs, interviewing current and former Chinese officials, uh, American officials who have been uh, uh, engaged with Chinese diplomats over the years, and the sum total of this is a, an unparalleled exploration of how the Communist Party of China was able to take this ragtag group of communist revolutionaries 70 plus years ago and forge them into this now significant global diplomatic power. But critically, I think Pete's long-term on the ground experience in China as a political analyst both before he became a journalist and then obviously reporting on China is critical here because this book to me is as much a analysis of China's political system, its domestic political system, the exigencies and imperatives of the CCP and how these shape China's approach to diplomacy and, and also how they shape the career incentives for China's diplomats. Uh, so anyone who's looking to understand how China behaves in the world but also trying to understand China's political system will we'll learn a great deal uh, from this book. And as the subtitle hints, um, the, the roots of Wolf Warrior uh, are, are quite deep and, and Pete will explore this today. We don't have a lot of time, so I wanna get right into it. Um, but first, just a few logistic notes. Uh, um, uh, folks who wanna ask a question, either as Pete's giving his remarks or when we get into the Q and A, can do so if you go to the events page for this specific event on CSIS.org, you'll see a little box where you can submit questions. And we've already got some great questions coming in. Um, as always, questions that are succinct and, and directly related to today's discussion will have a, uh, a, a higher chance of being posed to, to the group. Um, so please do so at, at any point. As soon as Pete is done in his remarks, uh, my colleague Scott Kennedy uh, will come on and he will introduce our recently departed uh, colleague, Bonnie Glazer, um, who will join us for a roundtable discussion um, uh, on Pete's book and some of the themes that it discusses. So uh, I'm really looking forward to today's event. And with that, let me turn it over to uh, comrade Pete Martin. Pete, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Jude and Scott, for hosting me today. And, uh, and thank you to Bonnie for returning to her old stomping ground at CSIS uh, for this. I appreciate it. Um, so I thought I would talk a little bit about uh, how I came to write the book and then uh, a little bit about, you know, some of the, the key findings and themes that I've got. And then I'm, I'm glad that we're leaving lots of time for discussion because I think it's going to be um, a lot of fun. So I arrived back in China after a few years away in early 2017. And I was immediately struck by how much economic and military progress the country had made. You know, China was rolling out this ambitious Belt and Road infrastructure initiative across the world. It was militarizing its artificial islands in the South China Sea. 
And crucially, it had this huge opportunity with the Trump administration that seemed to be picking fights with US allies all over the place and criticizing international organizations. Uh, it had this big opportunity to kind of make progress in its, in its reputation and its ability to be a leader. And yet somehow uh, this didn't seem to be coming together. You know, there was, there was a missed opportunity. And it struck me that, that alongside this, this economic and military progress, this was a real shortcoming for China. And it was going to be a shortcoming that would be really important in the years going forward. You know, as we move into a world where, uh, you know, US power is slowly waning and no one country can uh, dictate to others how the international system is going to work, there'll be a real premium on diplomacy and the ability to persuade. So I started looking into, you know, how does China do on that front? And the, you know, the more I looked into it, the more I came to see Chinese diplomats in particular as a kind of microcosm of China's struggle to communicate with the world. You know, when I, when I interacted with them in person, the people had studied at Georgetown and they were fluent in Czech and Indonesian. They could be suave and funny. But when they got up on the podium in the foreign ministry or when they sat down with their foreign counterparts, there was just this kind of stilted behavior and increasingly over the years, kind of this aggressive and bewildering behavior. Um, and, and so I started to get into this, this collection of uh, diplomats memoirs as I, um, you know, tried to delve into the roots of this and quickly discovered that there were more than a hundred of these books, most of which hadn't been used in English language studies of China. And, you know, they're boring. Uh, and their hard work, but they contain little details that shed light on what it's like to work on the front line of Chinese diplomacy. And so I started to try and mine those. Uh, and, you know, as, as Jude suggested, in 2017, when I started, this was a pretty niche, uh, pretty geeky topic that didn't dissuade Jude from encouraging me to do it because he's pretty niche and geeky himself. But, um, Anyway, I started off on this project and as the years rolled on, it just became increasingly mainstream. And if you, if you looked at any of the confirmation hearings on Capitol Hill over the last couple of months, you'll see that it, Wolf Warrior Diplomacy has become a really important topic across the US government and indeed across the world. We've had Chinese diplomats uh, spreading conspiracy theories about the origins of COVID-19 storming out of international meetings and even telling their foreign counterparts to shut up. Um, but I guess my big takeaway from, from writing the book is that while wolf warrior diplomacy seems very new on the surface, its roots actually go back uh, a long, long way. So when the PRC was founded in, in 1949, uh, it basically had no diplomats to speak of. Uh, the Kuomintang, fled to Taiwan and the, the small number of diplomats who had stayed behind were rejected by the new government as too ideologically impure to represent the PRC internationally. Uh, and so the China's new communist government faced a quite paradoxical challenge. Uh, you know, on the one hand, this was a highly paranoid political regime, which was obsessed with secrecy and constantly worried about how the outside world might undermine its power. And on the other hand, it really needed to communicate with the world. It needed to build friends and, uh, and, and, and develop its influence. And so to square that circle, China's first foreign minister and premier, Zhou Enlai, came up with this idea that Chinese diplomats would act like the People's Liberation Army in civilian clothing. So they would be unfailingly loyal to the party they'd be disciplined to a fault and they'd display a fighting spirit as they protected China's interests across the world. And that martial ethos uh, created a bunch of really distinctive behaviors which have lasted from 1949 through to today. So Chinese diplomats stick closely to talking points when they're meeting with foreign counterparts, even if they know that those talking points won't resonate. They often move around in pairs so that they can keep tabs on each other. They will at times shout at foreign counterparts if they feel cornered 
or if they feel like they might not look tough enough back home. And they will elevate even the smallest of incidents into sometimes very major diplomatic issues uh, if they worry that not doing so will make them look disloyal. Um, and so these, you know, this approach led to what we would now call wolf warrior style displays right from the outset, um, especially at times of domestic uncertainty. So in 1950, a Chinese diplomat uh, who was a he was a veteran revolutionary, uh, Wu Xiuquan, who you know he had a the guy had a scar on his face from being hit with a bullet. Uh, he led a delegation to the United Nations in New York, and he delivered this speech, which uh, you know frankly makes today's wolf warriors look like a bunch of wimps. Uh, Time magazine described it as two hours of awful rasping vituperation. Um, and, you know, in, the, in successive decades, especially during the Cultural Revolution, those kinds of aggressive, assertive tendencies played out again. And uh, in the 60s, Chinese diplomats were even seen literally wielding axes on the streets of London. Um, but alongside that tendency toward assertiveness and aggression was another tradition in Chinese diplomacy, which you can think of as kind of the, the, the charm offensive, um, persuasive tradition, which really was spearheaded, I guess, by Zhou Enlai. And uh, there, there were periods in the PRC's history when that same discipline that he laid out as the PLA and civilian clothing, the same discipline was applied to winning friends and, and persuading others. So in the 1950s, uh, famously at the Bandong Conference for African and Asian Developing Nations, Zhou Enlai uh, realized as he faced a great deal of, of uh, suspicion from the developing world that China's go-to talking points weren't gonna work. So he set aside his pre-prepared speech um, and he delivered an impromptu speech which addressed uh, you know, the needs of people in the room and didn't harp on ideology or the status of Taiwan. And he was actually able to build bridges by, by doing that. And then again, in the 1990s, um, after the Tiananmen massacre, uh, China launched a highly successful multi-decade charm offensive, which culminated in its hosting of the 2008 Summer Olympics. So I kind of think of these two tendencies as uh, working in a cycle and, 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 and ebbing and flowing over time. Uh, sometimes Chinese diplomats set out to charm the world, uh, and at other times they use wolf warrior tactics to, uh, to tell the world off. And I think recently we've seen a lurch back toward that kind of combative assertiveness. Um, and that's been driven, I think, by two things. One is a newfound confidence, and two is the existence of enduring insecurities. Um, and so the new confidence started really in 2008-9 in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, uh, when we saw a couple of years of really assertive diplomacy from China. Um, and then it became increasingly apparent after Xi Jinping became Communist Party boss in 2012. But at the same time, as we've seen a new confidence, uh, China's political system has become an increasingly scary place. So Xi Jinping launched a sweeping anti-corruption campaign, which punished 1.5 million officials. Um, he abolished presidential term limits. He's experimented with re-education camps in Xinjiang, and he's focusing on ideology at home and foreign threats from abroad. <clears throat> and you know, when, when Chinese diplomats see these signals from the top leadership, they're acutely aware of how they need to interpret them. Um, over the decades, they've experienced multiple rounds of purges at home as colleagues have informed on each other and got others in trouble. Uh, and in the Cultural Revolution, you know, things got so extreme that ambassadors were locked in cellars, they were made to clean toilets, they were beaten until they coughed up blood. Um, and, and large groups of Chinese diplomats were in fact sent to re-education camps uh, in that period. And so they know exactly how high the stakes can be for getting on the wrong side of Chinese politics. And so I think all of these things kind of coalesced to create 
a new tone for Chinese diplomacy uh, in the last couple of years, as diplomats began to mimic Xi Jinping's language about China moving closer to the center of the world stage. And they even began handing out copies of his book, just like uh, Chinese diplomats had done in the Cultural Revolution, handing out Mao Zedong's little red book. Um, and this new tone really went into high gear after the coronavirus outbreak. So China was under attack for its role in covering up the origins of the virus. Um, and it also felt like its model had been vindicated as it watched the US and Europe flounder in, in their response to it. And the result was a series of outbursts, apparently cheered on by Xi Jinping, who even issued a handwritten note to the foreign ministry calling for more fighting spirit. Um, and I think one diplomat above all, Zhao Lijian, has kind of become the face of this new style of Chinese diplomacy. And Zhao was a relatively obscure figure, a diplomat posted to Islamabad, who rocketed to fame when he picked a Twitter fight with uh, former national security advisor, Susan Rice, and ended up being appointed to foreign ministry spokesman, one of the, making him one of the most high profile faces of the Chinese government internationally. You know, Zhao, um, I mean, he, in fairness, he's angered pretty much everyone who's come across his path, but most famously um, provoked the Trump White House when he suggested that the US army had deliberately spread COVID-19 in Wuhan. And, you know, but Zhao's not alone. Uh, you think of a figure like Gui Tongyo in Sweden, who was summoned to the Swedish foreign ministry 40 times in two years. And uh, when asked about it in the media, he said, for our friends, we have fine wine, and for our enemies, we have shotguns. Um, and so there is this new approach. Not everyone likes it, there are large sections of China's diplomatic elite that are uncomfortable with it. Uh, Yuan Nansheng, who's China's former consul general in San Francisco, warned of a trend toward extreme nationalism in Chinese foreign policy. And most recently, in fact, Xi Jinping himself seems to have hinted that things may have gone slightly too far in calling in a recent Politburo study session for a more lovable image of China which I think is at least a modest recognition that Chinese diplomats have been more frightening than, uh, than lovable in recent years. But uh, you know, if, you, if you delve into the origins um, of the diplomatic service, you'll see that this fighting spirit that we've seen recently has been there right from the very beginning. And so with that, um, thank you. And I'll hand it over to you guys for, for questions and discussion. Well, great, thank you, Pete. And, uh two minutes under time, which is great, um, uh, which we can allocate for, for robust discussion afterwards. So let me now turn the virtual podium over to uh, colleague and comrade, Scott Kennedy, the, the trustee chair, Chinese business and economics here at CSIS. Perfect, well, thank you, Jude. And, and thank you, Peter. That's a really fantastic look. And uh, luckily we have uh, with us uh, one of the leading commentators and analysts on Chinese foreign policy, Bonnie Glazer uh, with, with us. Uh, Jude mentioned at the, out, at the very beginning, she's recently departed. Usually when I hear that phrase recently departed for somebody, it's not because they changed jobs, it's, be, it's for other reasons. But in this instance, luckily, it's simply because Bonnie has moved uh, a few blocks away from CSIS uh, to the German Marshall Fund where she's now director of the Asia program there uh, and focused heavily on uh, encouraging transatlantic cooperation on, on China policy, which we all know is now front and center uh, in, in terms of American foreign policy overall and uh, world attention. Uh, there's could be no one uh, better qualified to offer uh, comments and feedback uh, on Peter's book. Uh, I'm gonna turn the floor over to Bonnie now, look forward to uh, your, your comments and then uh, a vigorous discussion. So thanks for being with us this morning, Bonnie. Well, thank you, Scott, and it's always wonderful to uh, collaborate with my uh, former CSIS colleagues, and I know we will continue to do so going forward. Uh, this is really a terrific book, um, and in fact, I did a podcast uh, with Peter um, a while back uh, to talk uh, initially about the book. Um, one second.
Sorry about that, guys. So, um, uh, and and uh, I've 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 read it um, now uh, in 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 depth and actually a couple of times as I read it again before this uh, session. And uh, there's really a lot of interesting things to learn from the book. And, and the timing of this event couldn't be better since we just had uh, the collective Polyper study session that uh, Xi Jinping did, which Peter referenced. And uh, Xi Jinping uh, not only said that China should be more lovable and respectable, um, which I take as meaning should be respected, <laughs> um, but maybe it's also respectable, uh, but he called for public opinion struggle. And this is a, a, a theme that Xi Jinping talks about, struggle in a lot of components of his policies and dealing with uh, the international um, community. Uh, also at home, struggle is very central to what Xi Jinping thinks is necessary in order to achieve the, um, the really ambitious goals that he has set for China in uh, you know, 2035, 2049, and uh, interim strategies that are being uh, pursued. So I wanna highlight a couple of things that really uh, resonate uh, with me in, in reading this book and uh, start with the, the origin of PRC Diplomatic Corps, which I thought was uh, a really interesting and important um, uh, coverage of how the, uh, the diplomacy really was conceived very early on. And Peter explains that after the Chinese Communist Party won the Civil War, that Zhou Enlai told Mao that he picked generals from the military to be ambassadors because they were all frontline proletarian soldiers. And he, and he set out to build this civilian army. And interestingly, um, um, Mao at the time apparently noted that generals were less likely to defect, which could undermine this newly established um, revolutionary country. And, and I think that's interesting that they were concerned from the very beginning um, about uh, loyalty. Uh, this is a theme that really, I think, persists uh, today. Uh, people in the, the foreign ministry, um, uh, in order to get into China's foreign ministry, there are certain things you have to do or cannot do. Um, and my guess is that if you're uh, educated abroad these days, you have a lot of trouble getting into the foreign ministry. So it's from the very beginning, serving as a diplomat really was viewed as a new way of conducting struggle. It, it was different from the Civil War, but it was still struggle. Um, and as Peter said, Joe referred to these diplomats as the PLA in uh, civilian uh, clothing. Um, secondly, it isn't surprising, but I think it's really worth noting that China's drive for international respectability really has strong historical roots. And um, uh, one anecdote that I thought was really interesting in the book was that in Yan'an in 1944, there was this U.S. Army Observer Group that visited the communists and uh, the party's new diplomats were instructed that the foreigners would have to be respectful of China's national dignity. And it's interesting. It seems that, to me that that was really an important consideration in, in an early meeting um, and, of course, is very central to Chinese diplomacy today. Um, another land, longstanding component of Chinese diplomacy is the objective of dividing China's opponents. Um, and, and Peter provides a really interesting account of the Geneva Conference in 1954, where China sought to capitalize on contradictions in the positions of the United States, Britain, and France uh, over the Indochina issue. And this is, and again, you know, it's a, a feature that, of Chinese diplomacy that, uh, that persists today. I was, I was really struck um, uh, also by uh, how Chinese diplomats have always been kept on a, on a very short leash. And uh, there are some interviews that Peter uh, does and talks about in, in the book with some of the US uh, foreign service experts um, who talk about how China really, their diplomats are unable to take the initiative and that this really hampers them in, in being the best diplomats and, and pursuing the interests uh, of the People's Republic of China. So, you know, there are accounts of uh, Chinese diplomats having to obtain prior approval and instructions for, for everything. Um, and, and, and this really, I think, makes it difficult for, uh, for the, the diplomats 
um, to to use their training and have uh, flexibility and 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 operate in ways uh, that they could advance Chinese interests. So we see this in negotiations with China today. They come in with their with their talking points, and even though it may sound like they're speaking in an impromptu way, I think um, they're very much sticking uh, to those talking points. Always have to go back to the center um, uh, in order to get approval to to do um, anything. Um, a couple of other just quick points. Uh, Peter writes about what Chinese diplomats are, are good at as well. And I think that's really interesting. And I think they also really resonate with me. Very good at keeping secrets, um, good at staying on the same page, um, fantastic institutional memory. Uh, if you're ever in a room with a Chinese diplomat, uh, they, they know what has transpired and conversations on the particular issue you're talking about for, for decades um, prior um, and, and really are, are trained in understanding that history. And I think our diplomats don't necessarily excel at that. Uh, they're very good at sending clear messages, uh, getting across their point um, and, and making demands when they uh, need to. And so uh, uh, the other thing that I failed to mention that they're not good at is that they're not good at being persuasive and they're not so good at building relationships with foreigners. And this is really important in diplomacy, I think, for people to build relationships. And I think that um, the Chinese are not very good um, at, at, at doing that, probably because they're, um, they would rather err on the side of being um, uh, cautious and, uh, and rather than being forward leaning and maybe potentially get in trouble if they build relationships that could um, damage them. Um, and then uh, finally, you know, the, the training of Chinese diplomats from the early days instilled um, fear of the outside world. And, and, and I always guess that that's still true today. Um, and it may make it more difficult for Chinese diplomats to truly comprehend foreign societies and political systems that are different from their own. Um, because there is this fear that that is instilled in them um, and their and their training, and, and Peter's book really underscores that um, that Chinese diplomats have long been more concerned about looking weak in front of domestic audiences than a tr than a truly improving China's reputation abroad, um, and 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 I think that's really an, an important point. And of course, another I think theme throughout. Uh, the book is that foreign policy is very much subsumed under domestic policy and domestic politics. And, and of, co of course, um, uh, we, we know that uh, continues today. So my very, very last point is what Peter uh, closed with about confidence and, and insecurity. And I think it is, I, I would agree that, um, what, that Chinese confidence about their country is growing. Yes, you can trace it back to the origins of the global financial crisis. This has continued during the pandemic. But observers of China should understand that there is still quite a bit of insecurity, that both coexist. And Chinese assertiveness and arrogance and wolf warrior diplomacy can sometimes be better understood as stemming from insecurity, um, not, uh, not confidence. And I think that that's something that we should pay attention to going, going forward. Um, China's um, confidence, if it's overconfidence, um, might be um, misplaced and be a challenge for uh, other countries to deal with. But that insecurity also poses challenges as well. So thanks again uh, for writing the book. And I hope uh, all of those listening today uh, will, uh, will read it and engage uh, with this topic, which I think is going to be really important going forward. Terrific, thank you, Bonnie. Uh, super helpful comments tonight. Uh, I wanna also encourage everyone to read the book and also, uh, is the podcast uh, already been played or is it coming out soon? So it was uh, a podcast that I think we actually did about maybe four or five months ago. Um, Peter might remember exactly when, but it's on um, it's on China Power. But now I have to tell you that my new podcast is China Global uh, <laughs> with uh, GMF. But they're both terrific podcasts. <laughs> indeed, indeed, indeed. So we want we want to make sure everybody gets the full three hundred sixty degrees of, of 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 Peter's book and these these podcasts. Uh, I have. Uh, Thank you for those remarks. Let me offer a couple questions that I'm thinking of, uh, sort of comments slash questions. And then I'm, I've got a couple from the audience. We'll get uh, Peter's uh, reactions and then we'll uh, Jude will uh, offer some of his uh, questions and things that he's thinking about as, as well. 
and work in some additional audience questions. So I, I, I wanna continue to um, praise what I think is a core issue of, of finding of the book is that you've done such a great job of fitting Chinese diplomatic behavior into the context of Chinese domestic politics. Uh, and not just that people have to, uh, diplomats have to understand what the domestic political trends are, but the operating DNA of the Chinese Communist Party and its origins, how it's evolved, uh, the personalities that created this style. And it's really hardwired a lot of what how Chinese uh, diplomats behave. And I think that is absolutely crucial. And you, you just capture it, it brilliantly. I would say having uh, seen that, I would never want to work in the Chinese foreign ministry. <laughs> um, it sounds like a really, really difficult job. Uh, and I'm not a very disciplined person. Uh, that's why I wanted to be a professor and why I enjoy working at CSIS and coming up with all different kinds of opinions and debating and things outside. It just sounds like the, a, a very difficult job where you have to read the tea leaves of the system all the time and, and force yourself to operate there. It doesn't allow for a lot of of intellectual entrepreneurship, because uh, it's very risky. Um, and I, I've met, uh, I've had friends over the years uh, from China who uh, had considered working in the foreign ministry and decided not to for these kinds of, of reasons. So I think uh, it, this ends up affecting the type of people that choose to go in or not go into the foreign ministry uh, because of, uh, of, of the way the system operates. Uh, a, a question that a, a broad question that jumps out from my reading of, of the book and, and just observing China over the time is, is I always trying to look for uh, variation. And, and I think a, an important theme of your book is, is continuity over time, even though there's this dichotomy. And I'm wondering to what extent is uh, their, you know, wolf warrior diplomacy uh, is it, a, it sounds like to some extent it's about style, diplomatic style. And, but it's also to some extent about substance, about the content of what the Chinese are advocating. Uh, but sometimes I feel like the conversation is about sort of happy socialists, happy diplomats versus angry diplomats. Mm. Uh, and so sometimes we, you know, I can think of Chinese diplomats who are always, um, sort of calm and engaging and uh, seem to fig be thinking about what the audience might, how the audience might respond. And I'm thinking of Chinese ambassador Tsui Tian Kai to the United States or Fuing, China's former ambassador to the UK. Um, very different from uh, Zhao Lijian or, or Yang Jiechi. Uh, so I'm wondering to what extent it's, it's sort of about sort of the emotive difference between that happy versus angry, or is there a real substantive difference that we can see cutting across uh, these different um, uh, diplomats? Um, and then I'm also wondering, you know, I've, because I, I interact some with folks from the foreign ministry in that part, but I also interact with folks from the Ministry of Science and Technology, Ministry of Commerce, finance folks, technocrats. And do you see a difference between technocrats who have to interact globally and push China's position on trade or investment or finance or technology uh, versus these generalists who have to represent the national interests as a whole? Uh, as the, or are we seeing sort of a greater unification across uh, these different types of, of groups? I guess last thing, and uh, this sort of brings together some thoughts that we hear from uh, questions offered by the audience watching this morning, is what should the, given, given Wolf Warrior diplomacy uh, and its long heritage and its uh, the unlikelihood that it's going to disappear even if China becomes more lovable uh, following Xi's advice, what should the U.S. do? How should uh, the State Department, National Security Council, how should they take the lessons drawn from your book in, uh, the next time they have to interact with uh, Chinese diplomats? So let me pause there. Great book and look forward to your uh, reactions, Pete, and then we'll, we'll hand things over to you. Yeah, great questions. Thank you, Scott. Um, I, guess, I, guess, I guess a few things that the anger um, piece is really uh, a tactic. So, you know, like I said, it's 
It's been something that they've done since 49. Um, and it's something that even individuals who we might think of as the more, you know, on the, on this kind of suave and charming end of Chinese diplomacy uh, will do at times as well. And, and, and they did before Xi Jinping became leader too, you know. So um, if you look at accounts of Kurt Campbell uh, negotiating with Tui Ting Kai over the release of the blind activist Chen Guancheng from, um, the, from the US embassy and issues over whether he would be able to make it to the US, um, Tui shouted in some of those encounters and really engaged in performative anger because he felt that that was necessary in order to get across China's point and um, in order to make sure that he uh, was perceived in the right way by um, his superiors watching over him. Um, and so, you know, it's, some, it's something I think that flows through all aspects of PRC diplomacy, but it's really been played up um, in the last um, few years. Um, on the technocrats point, it's, it's, it's really interesting. And there is this whole um, ecosystem which has developed, especially since the beginning of reform and opening in China, where China doesn't just have diplomats that come from the foreign ministry, but they also come from the Ministry of Commerce. Um, you know, there are, there are science and technology diplomats, there are health diplomats, environmental diplomats. Um, I think that often those folks, you know, I, I've, I've talked to some US negotiators about this. I was talking to Charlene Bashevsky, the, the former USTR about it recently. And she said that, that when you sit down with these people, they tend to be a little bit less ideological there tends to be, uh, you know, less lecturing about China's history um, and a little bit more focus on detail and let's get down to business. Um, but I think what runs across um, all interactions in PRC diplomacy, whether it is, um, you know, from a central ministry in Beijing or a province or even a state-owned company um, or, you know, a, a state-run trade union is this focus on discipline and one message. Does, it's not always perfect, but it's pretty good considering the scale of the country we're talking about. Um, and I, I remember reading a, a one of the most turgid and dull books I've read in my life, but I remember reading a history of the diplomacy of the, uh, the, 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 the main Chinese trade union in Beijing. And uh, what was really striking from it was uh, the, the repetition of phrases that Zhou and Lai had used to describe Chinese diplomacy. So, so uh, you know, uh, there's no such thing as a small matter in diplomacy. It's something that was taught to foreign ministry officials, and it's also taught to trade unionists when they interact with people on the outside world. So I guess that there are, there are differences, but there are striking um, continuities. Um, I don't know that um, I am in the best position to provide kind of policy advice to uh, to interlocutors with dealing with Chinese diplomats. I guess what I would say is, uh, you know, always can always think about who the audience is um, when you're being addressed, right? Like if you if you're being shouted at or there is uh, ideological vitriol aimed at aimed toward your person, think about whether you're the audience for that or if it's actually someone uh, listening in from, uh, from the party center. Um, and, and, and be aware that there is a difference between public performance and the ability to um, negotiate and engage, right? I think accounts coming out of the Anchorage meetings between uh, Wang Yi, Yang Jiechi, and Jake Sullivan and Tony Blinken show that, you know, Yang Jiechi delivered the 17 minute angry lecture at the outset, but once the cameras left, he seemed to have been pretty amenable and, and wanted to talk details. Um, so I guess one lesson is that there's always that dis distinction there. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, Jude, over to you. Great. Thanks, Scott. Um, we've got some really great questions coming in, Pete. And so if I can, I'd like to pose three of them to you to bundle these together. Um, one of these anticipates uh, one that I had wanted to ask you, which is, I know you were focused on 
the history and, and origins of Chinese diplomacy, but I'm curious if you have any thoughts on how regime type may affect approaches to diplomacy. In other words, um, any possible, um, um, I think connections or overlaps with how say diplomats from the Soviet Union uh, acted or contemporary diplomats from the DPRK. In other words, do some of the same political incentives that you've talked about here seem to exist in other more closed authoritarian systems versus more, more open democratic systems? Um, second question, which came in in a few variations to us is, you talked about some of the structural um, features of China's, uh, you know, the paranoid, paranoid style of Chinese politics and insecurity, as well as some contingent features like the global financial crisis. One that you hadn't mentioned, which overlaps with the rise of Wolf Warrior, is the you know, hashtag swagger approach that we saw under the previous administration, the Trump administration, which was taking a harder line on China. And so I think variation in some of the questions here is, isn't China just responding to a more aggressive approach and confrontational approach from, from the United States? This didn't, this didn't spring de novo. Uh, from nowhere. So um, that's question number two. And then the final one is uh, variation. Scott was mentioning this, but I'm curious if you saw, um, is Wolf Warrior the style all over the world? Or do we see China approaching various countries or geographies or specific issues with a more modulated, moderated, agreeable uh, uh, approach here? So I guess how, how, um, how widespread is Wolf Warrior, or are we just seeing the very visible verbal tip of the iceberg? And that actually, if you were to get down into the depths of it, um, that Chinese diplomacy operates much like it does in, in other countries. So, so those are three questions bundled together. Great, great questions. Um, the first one uh, is an area that actually really fascinates me. And I think that, that it's right that there are links uh, across kind of closed regime types in terms of how diplomacy is conducted. Most importantly, there are links between uh, Leninist, communist political systems. And that's that's not just, um, you know, there was, and that, that's conscious, that's by design. So in the early days of the PRC, um, China's embassy in uh, Moscow would go to the uh, the Soviet foreign ministry and they would receive uh, talks on how to conduct their diplomacy. Uh, the embassy wrote up those notes, sent them back to Beijing, and they were used as teaching material for future diplomats. Uh, you know, Hungarian and Polish diplomats from the Soviet bloc in Beijing offered instructions on diplomatic protocol and international law and the structure of the foreign service and all kinds of things like that which um, were really um, critical in, in, in putting together China's diplomatic approach. And, um, you know, in a, in a strange way, that kind of Soviet Eastern Bloc approach to diplomacy um, has outlived the Soviet Union in, in the Chinese political system. Um, in terms of Trump, I think absolutely it had a catalyzing effect. Um, you know, it, it, I, don't, I don't think that Trump was the cause of Wolf Warrior diplomacy. I think that um, the, the, the primary thing that's happening is that Chinese diplomats are looking at the words and actions of Xi Jinping and trying their best to reflect that in, in what they do and how they act. So when he talks about China nearing the center of the world stage, or he talks about how China will never give up one inch of territory, as he said to former Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis, um, they, they see those cues and they, they pick up and copy them. But what I do think is the case is that China is, Chinese diplomats are most likely to turn toward those kind of tactics when they feel threatened and when they feel like China is under attack, and especially when they feel like China's political system is under attack, which is how they felt when uh, Secretary of State Pompeo, former Secretary of State Pompeo, talked about the, the way that CCP rule was illegitimate and, and really went after the, the Chinese system of governance. The response of Chinese diplomats was really unparalleled. I can't think of another recent political figure which the, the PRC foreign ministry has attacked in such personal terms as Pompeo. And I think the reason is that they felt threatened by what he said. 
Um, so I certainly think that Trump had an important um, catalyzing effect. And, but, but, you know, that's tempered, I think, um, and this, this kind of moves on to the, the third question about how widespread these tactics are. This wasn't just something that was aimed toward the US or US aligned countries, right? We saw Chinese diplomats um, storming into the office of the, the foreign minister of Papua New Guinea, storming out of meetings uh, in the Pacific Islands, um, talking tough in South Africa, insulting uh, members of Bolsonaro's family in Brazil, um, picking fights in Venezuela, uh, you know, in, a, in addition to all of the other stuff we saw about, um, you know, directed towards the US, Canada, Britain, France, Germany, you name it. And so I, I think that this was something actually, you know, if, if anything, uh, the US tends to get slightly softer treatment um, from China than some smaller countries, because the Chinese system understands that uh, no matter how the US is behaving, it's too big and too powerful to ignore it, and you have to work with it and engage it. Um, so if anything, I think that, that China's approach has kind of been tougher towards smaller countries than it has the US. Great, thanks, Pete. Uh, Scott, over to you for the next round. Um, well, uh, you wouldn't take my bait on giving advice to uh, Washington, but maybe you could give advice to Beijing. Uh, and uh, I guess there's a question, you know, what could they, is it, is it just about, you know, being uh, sort of calmer, would, would that get them to be more effective? Um, or is it really the goals that they're, they're seeking? I mean, could they, I mean, if, 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 you, if you want to turn the South China Sea into a Chinese lake, uh, is really, you know, if that's your goal, it doesn't matter whether you ask nicely or scream at everyone about it, or uh, be some, what you're doing in Hong Kong or Xinjiang. So is, is this about, what, what, what could we tell the Chinese? Because now that you've, you know the, their, diplo their diplomacy more than anybody, what would be some just sort of general suggestions or, or sort of what works and what doesn't? Maybe that's the, the way to frame it. Um, and um, so why don't, I, why don't I stop there? And then also want to let Bonnie jump in here as well to, to hear her thoughts on some of these after, after you, Pete. Yeah. Um... I, I refuse to be baited by you, Scott, under any circumstances, but I will offer some thoughts on your question. Um, I think that uh, wolf warrior diplomacy is a part of a much bigger package of policies in terms of assertiveness from China, right? So there, there has been a doubling down on industrial policy, which upsets Western companies and governments. There is the use of uh, re-education camps in Xinjiang. There is the abolition of term limits and, um, you know, kind of overruling and, and discarding of, of, of political norms that governed the Chinese political system over the last couple of decades. All of these things have set, and, and, and the foreign policy in South China Sea piece that you mentioned, all of these things have set China on a collision course with Western governments and especially the US government. Um, and without some fundamental change in policy from Beijing, um, it's really difficult for me to see how there can be this kind of broader reset of China's foreign relations, because there are too many people who are too upset about these policy issues right now for uh, different packaging to really um, change the equation. And I think you know, if you if you think about China's 1990s and early 2000s charm offensive, it's quite instructive, right? So Chinese diplomats were really skillful at engaging their foreign counterparts. They worked hard on their messaging, uh, especially when they were talking to to regional countries in Asia. But they also liberalized their economy and prepared for WTO membership, and they. Uh, minimize the use, the, the amount that ideology was spoken about. They invited entrepreneurs to, to join the Communist Party. 
um, you know, they engaged in border negotiations with, with Chinese neighbors. And so they, it wasn't just that the, the style of Chinese diplomacy was successful. They had a package to sell, which was going to be appealing to outsiders. And I think that's the real challenge now. You know, if you're a Chinese diplomat, and someone criticizes the use of re-education camps, how on earth do you phrase that in a way that's going to be persuasive to someone in Washington? I'm not sure that you can. And maybe, maybe your best bet in that situation is just to shout the opponent down rather than try to engage. Um, so I think, I think that's important. I think an, another, another sort of piece that Beijing needs to think about is how its actions are perceived now that China is thought of as a great power, right? So I think that misinformation is, is, is a good example here. Foreign ministry officials or PRC state media outlets spreading information which Western countries believe is, is damaging to their democratic process. That is seen in a really different way when you do it as the second biggest economy in the world than it is if you're a smaller economy, even, even when it's done by Russia, it's more threatening when it takes place by the PRC. And so I think that there needs to be a, a sort of understanding that with great power comes a great deal of scrutiny. And uh, you, you can't just say, well, other people do this, so we're gonna do it too. You need to think about um, how your actions are gonna be weighted and judged. That's fantastic. I, I guess the message I take is what, what diplomats are selling is different. If you go back to what Chen Chi Chun was trying to sell based on the people around him and what Jiang Zemin was doing, that's different than what China, what Wang Yi, Yang Jiechi have to offer folks given the policy that, that they are, are having to advocate for, which leads to a different style. So I think that's, that's, that, that's extremely, extremely important. And I always hear from Chinese is that Yes, now that we're a great power, uh, we should get more respect, uh, but it doesn't necessarily translate into because we're a great power, we have greater responsibilities to be more careful with how we act internationally. So I think that's always been something when, when, we, when uh, the US in 2004 and five said, we want China to be a responsible stakeholder. I think uh, that part of the message I think is something that they've not entirely absorbed uh, from, from others. Bonnie? Thoughts? Um, yeah, I'll jump in on a couple of points. First, I really want to footstomp what Peter said earlier about smaller countries experiencing wolf warrior di diplomacy um, in a more intense way and earlier on than the United States, uh, because China saw the United States as the sole superpower, um, recognized that the gap between China's comprehensive national power in the U.S. Uh, for, for years was, was quite wide. And so I think actually many countries around the world are just sort of nodding their heads now and say, yeah, we've been, we've been seeing this for some time. Um, and uh, so if you talk to diplomats from smaller countries, they will tell you specific um, instances in which Chinese diplomats have um, it, it issued threats or um, uh, told them about how they will be um, punished in some ways if they uh, damage Chinese interests, which in fact they have been. Secondly, um, I, I don't think we've uh, really emphasized enough that wolf warrior diplomacy really comes from the top. This is really encouraged by Xi Jinping. And uh, there are many diplomats, I think, who just feel that this is the time to do this and use this to get maybe promotions and rewards, um, even though there are individuals, perhaps like Ambassador Cui Tian Kai, who do not want to get on board with this and have found that his own experience and style of, of being more moderate um, has been more effective. And so there are individuals who are reluctant to get on board with this and don't see the need to respond to the call to be more um, aggressive and combative. So, but, but it is coming from the top. And then um, thirdly, um, you know, I think that the tone of uh, dip, that dip Chinese diplomats use really does depend on the audience and the circumstance. 
Um, so of course, we're not seeing wolf warrior diplomacy all the time. Um, and it, when we listen to speeches that are made in multilateral settings, um, uh, the Chinese will talk um, in a very different tone. Um, they continue to try to drive wedges, I think, between the United States um, and its allies. They'll talk about China's respect for international law, its emphasis on multilateralism, when in fact the behavior um, is quite different um, from the words that they are saying. So uh, to me, this is, this is, uh, it is planned, it is orchestrated, um, and it is used very deliberately. As Peter said, it's not really in anger. Um, it is really quite deliberate. Um, and uh, there are examples that go back uh, e even um, uh, before uh, Xi Jinping to Chinese diplomats doing this. Uh, Yang Jiechi, for example, at the 2010 ASEAN Regional Forum, uh, uh, apparently was spoke quite loudly and sharply in anger when he uh, pointed at uh, the Singapore's foreign minister and said, you know, you're a small country, we are all big countries. But then apparently they broke into the bilat that they had with the United States and it was all, you know, the, the usual down to business, just as it was, as Peter said, in Anchorage. Great, well, thank you. We, we've got just a few minutes left, so I wanted to, uh, pose a question to both Bonnie and, and Pete as a as a final future trajectory question. We've talked a lot about what have been the structural and and the uh, contingent dynamics which have shaped this this more assertive approach that we're calling Wolf Warrior. One of the ways we change approach and, and trajectory in democratic systems is through elections. And indeed, we've seen um, right or wrong, we've seen a shift in in tone and approach just since January 20th and in, in how the United States is approaching its diplomatic efforts um, and how it frames them. Um, Pete just mentioned the abolition or the abolishment of term limits for uh, the office of the presidency and the PRC. And of course, we're looking to the 20th party Congress late next fall where Xi Jinping is likely to take a third term as general secretary. And that therefore sets us up for indeterminate uh, a, a rule of an indeterminate length of time. And, and we're seeing now, I think in response, a wave of big think pieces arguing that Xi Jinping is isolated from information and data points uh, coming up through the system to him that could uh, provoke a, a course correction. Um, and therefore we may see a longer term uh, trajectory of, of Xi running the country off, off the rails with examples like the recent sanctions against the EU coming at a detrimental impact to the CAI, which had been a long held objective of, of Beijing. So I wanted to pose a final question here to um, uh, maybe, Bonnie, if you don't mind, I'll go to you and then give Pete the, the final, final word as we round out and maybe just, just short answers. Um, do you see course correction possible here, given the political domestic exigencies of the Xi administration? And if we think about this, him being in power for a long time, um, will we see the ability of China to course correct, which for a long time has been one of the key attributes of China's system. Once it, once it runs into an issue, it, it can pivot. Uh, Bonnie, first to you and then to Pete. Well, I think that um, first, I, I need to underscore that even if Wolf Warrior diplomacy um, in its tone changes as maybe the outcome of this Politburo study group that took place, uh, that although we should welcome a change in tone, we should continue to demand a change in, in, in policy. Um, it is uh, actually the policies, practices of uh, China that are most worrisome, not just the way that they talk to the world. And so the question remains, as you asked you, can China course correct? Um, and I think that on some issues, uh, there is the potential for influencing China's policy going forward. Issues that are within Chinese borders are the hardest. Xinjiang, for example, um, Hong Kong, um, issues that are um, China's core, the core of the core interests like Taiwan, also difficult, but not impossible. The farther away you get, uh, the more possible it is to influence uh, China's choices. I continue to believe that um, as we watch and listen to China's response to Biden administration policy, trying to forge 
coalitions with other countries, that this is what China fears most. Um, and it doesn't have, we don't have to call it anti-China coalitions, but coalitions to protect the interests of uh, countries uh, in the face of, uh, of what they see as threats from China. And so I don't rule out the possibility of uh, influencing the uh, China's some of China's policies going forward. I think we have a limited period to do this. Um, and you yourself, Jude, when you testified, said we are not engaged in a hundred year uh, marathon with China. It's a 10 year sprint. And, and so I think that's a great way to put it, that uh, we have a, a short period of time, I think, to continue to influence Chinese policies going forward. Um, and as if we work separate, if we are divided from allies and like-minded partners, um, then we, we, will, uh, we will certainly not be able uh, to influence China. So this is a very challenging period ahead um, on the eve, of course, of uh, President Biden visiting Europe and trying to strengthen transatlantic cooperation uh, to push back against some of China's more objectionable foreign policies. Great, thank you, Bonnie, great thoughts. Uh, Pete, uh, final, final thoughts on this, uh, just future trajectories here and, and the possibility of, of course corrections given the exigencies of the Xi administration. Yeah, I mean, so I think that um, a, a tweaking of tactics around wolf warrior diplomacy is quite possible. Um, as I think the, but most likely, I'm not sure that she, the way that she envisions China's role in the world allows for a more fundamental rethink um, of the strategy at the moment. He is very clear about the place that he wants China to occupy in 2035 and in 2050, and uh, very clear about the degree of international respect and deference which is going to accompany that position. And so I'm not sure that allows for um, a, a, a kind of much bigger rethink of, of, of diplomacy. I guess I just caution that uh, the Chinese political system, as you said, Jute, has been capable in, in terms of domestic policy with reform and opening and in terms of foreign policy of these incredible turnarounds in periods of its history. Um, none more surprising than Mao, the archetypal communists' ability to invite uh, Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon to Beijing. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not predicting a turnaround like that, but as she becomes more powerful, his ability to do things that go against the grain and surprise others will probably increase. So that's not a prediction, but uh, we, we should all be willing to be open to surprise, I guess. China's civilian army making a wolf warrior diplomacy uh, by Pete Martin is, is going on sale in just a few days. Um, I think I can speak for Pete when I say um, he wants you to buy it. He doesn't actually care if you read it. Um, <laughs> and, and he would prefer you buy it at full price because you really would only be discounting Pete if you, if you got it at a discounted price. But this is um, we've had a ton of great questions. We didn't get to the majority of them, unfortunately, but we will bundle these and, and share these with Pete just so he can, he can know what the, um, the hive mind of the collective is, is thinking on China and, and what folks are interested in. Um, really wonderful to to be sharing the stage again with uh, with with Bonnie Glazer and, and Scott Kennedy. This is a really fantastic conversation. I think for anyone who's trying to understand future trajectories of of China's international behavior and how it links back to changes in the domestic system, Pete, Pete's book is is really your your first uh, your first and maybe final stop there for the time being. So um, thank you very much to colleagues, Alyssa Perez and Lauren Moranto and, and everyone at CSIS and the IT and, and AV team who, who make all of this uh, possible. We really just get to slot in at the very end and do the easy part. So we're really great, grateful for everyone's help. Thank you very much and uh, see everyone at, a, at an upcoming CSIS event. Thank you.